Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is the third of five sessions about sensitivity. We've also been exploring the different channels or layers of human experience. We change channels, as it were, all the time. So right now you're tuned into the channel of this video on your screen, but you could very easily look off in another direction, pick up a book, you name it. We can change the direction of our attention at will. And we can do the same thing for interior experiences in the body. The four channels of experience that we're looking at are the object body, the body of ideas or concepts, looking at the body as a separate thing from the so-called mind, the mammal body, which is the body of direct experience of sensation, emotion, urges, the cell body, which in some traditions is referred to as the energy or subtle body. This is a sense of aliveness, which is rather diffuse, and the universe body, which is an experience of our human body as seamlessly involved in the rest of the cosmos. Today we'll be focusing primarily on the mammal body, though we'll also be using concepts about the object body developed in the earlier sessions. So we're using skin as a way of exploring sensitivity, which makes sense because the skin is so sensitive to the environment and brings us most intimately in contact with it. And the sensitivity of skin also brings us in contact with beloved beings around us, our lovers, family, friends, and beloved animals. When we have this direct skin-to-skin -skin contact, when we feel the warmth and vibration of another being, we feel feelings of affection and mutual support, which is very important to us as mammals. Because mammals do rely very much on direct contact with one another for social engagement. Even relatively solitary animals go through a phase like this when they are young. So what is a mammal, according to biologists? Well, it's a vertebrate organism that is warm-blooded, which is to say it maintains a constant or relatively constant internal body temperature, in our case, 37 degrees Celsius. It has fur or hair. Humans, of course, have hair, which is relatively sparse over much of the body. Other animals have dense fur, and there is a lot of variation in color, density, texture, length, etc. With just a couple of exceptions, all mammals give birth to young that are developed within a uterus or womb. And mammals nurture and nourish their young with a process of providing milk. So we see a typical mammal like a cat maintaining its constant interior temperature with a little assistance from a nice warm fire. We can see how densely furry it is. We're familiar to seeing pregnant mammals including pregnant humans. And we're familiar with the idea of nursing at the breast. So here's a little one with his mother, and you'll see he's a little mischievous, and she maintains control of him, and gradually he comes back to her and settles in, and they snuggle a bit, and then quite characteristically, he latches onto a nipple and begins to nurse. And there's obviously a lot of closeness here, an intimate and warm, emotional contact between mother and child. Now, the child, of course, is sucking at a mammary gland, which is actually the source of the word mammal. So this idea of nursing and receiving milk at the breast is quite central to mammalian life, including the mammalian life of humans. So we nurse at the breast when little. We also have warm bodies. We develop in a womb after a sexual coupling that involves a lot of intimate contact. And our bodies are warm and we enjoy the pleasure of holding each other's warm bodies, emphasizing the point how skin-to-skin -skin contact is so important to social animals like ourselves. You'll notice the skin is involved in all of these aspects that define mammalian life. Certainly the skin produces hair and is warm to the touch and helps regulate temperature as we saw in earlier talks. The infant, when it suckles at the breast, is connecting with the skin of the nipple to stimulate the letdown of milk. And although the womb is an interior organ, 
So when we have fetal development, we're inside the body, but the sexual intercourse that leads to fertilization and fetal development involves very intimate skin-to-skin -skin contact. Clearly, there's nothing surprising here, but it's worth noticing how involved the skin is in these aspects of mammalian life. So let's look at a diagram of skin similar to one we've seen before. And we're going to be looking at specialized structures within the skin that support these aspects of mammalian existence. And we'll begin by looking at some issues around hair and warmth, beginning with this warmness of the human body and how pleasant it feels to hold a loved one and feel that person's body warmth. So we detect warmth through sensors in the skin that are sensitive to temperature. They send information about temperature into a sensory nerve which travels to the spinal cord and then reaches the brain and consciousness. Looked at under higher magnification, we can see how the warmth sensors have very fine fibers that spread through the skin and end in little bulbs. There are similar sensors for cooler temperatures. And now let's move on and look at some issues related to hair. First of all, the function of hair and fur in mammals is, as noted, insulation. Obviously in humans, because we have very restricted distributions of hair, this insulating function is reduced, although in people that have a nice full head of hair, the scalp, which has a profuse blood supply, is in fact pretty well insulated. I'd also like to look at the sensory aspect of hair. That is, when a hair is jiggled or moved a little bit, we are very sensitive to that experience. We can feel it. So at the base of the hair follicle, there is a network of nerves that detect that little bit of movement and again feed into the same sort of sensory nerve that we talked about in the last image. Looked at under higher magnification, we can see how this is an intimate association between the nerve fibers and the hair shaft. The effect of this is to help us detect very subtle movements against the skin. And when that movement is occurring across a field of skin at the right pressure and rate of movement, it tends to feel pleasant to us. And this is what we call a caress. So these little nerve fibers around the base of the hair follicle function as caress sensors. And thus we can feel the pleasure of holding a beloved feeling, the soft movement, caressing them, feeling their warmth, all of this through these follicles and the warmth sensors and other ten touch modalities. We'll now move on and look at some other aspects of skin sensation. So here's a person walking along a beach and you can imagine the richness of this experience. When the foot strikes the sand and the body weight is placed on it, there's a feeling of pressure. The sand itself has a texture to it, a grittiness and a kind of squishiness at times. There's some vibration, both from the impacts of the walking and the movements of the water create small vibrations which are felt. And there are feelings of light touch, in this case particularly as the clothing moves against the skin and is you know, slightly jostled by the breeze. So these are additional sense modalities and they each have their own sensor within the skin. These are down a little lower than the warmth sensors we saw before and somewhat above the base of the hair follicles. Seen in much higher magnification, we can notice how geometrically different each of the sensors is. So the pressure sensor is long, the light touch sensor is a kind of disc, the texture sensor is a sort of capsule, and the vibration sensor looks a bit like an onion. These different structural geometries relate to the modality of touch that these sensors are each tuned for. So the geometry reflects function. And I should mention that I'm oversimplifying things quite a bit because each of these sensors picks up more than what is described here. And in addition, the combination of multiple types of sensors being stimulated provide additional information. Of course, we can add in the sensors we just saw. As this person walks and the water washes over the foot, there will be a feeling of coolness. And the water will also perhaps stimulate hair follicles in a way that'll feel like a kind of caress. So the body is continually picking up this information from the environment, although of course we don't always tune into what it's detecting. Perhaps if something presses extra hard against us, we will be alerted to it and turn our attention toward it. But we can also 
use our own capacity to tune into our own modes of sensitivity by shifting our attention. So here's another instance where there are different channels of information. So there's vibration and texture and warmth and so on. These are different feelings and we can tune into them separately. Let's move on and look again just briefly at the four types of bodies. I mentioned in earlier talks that the cell body and the universe body tend to provide more stable experiences. They are less affected by moment to moment changes in circumstance, mood, etc. They therefore provide a feeling of equanimity when we can tune into them. Unfortunately, we aren't really trained to tune into them in our culture, but this class will help remedy that a bit. And in the next two sessions, we'll focus on how to tune in to those equanimous channels of bodily experience. Before we get to that, it's important to continue exploring where we spend most of our time in daily life. I've already gone over the object body, and today we're focusing on the mammal body. And the experiences within these so-called bodies or channels often lead to a difficulty that we call suffering. Of course, they also provide pleasurable feelings and senses of passion and so on. But the suffering is an issue, and it's a central issue within Buddhism. So it's not uncommon to feel somehow terrified or angry or somehow just jangled. And we often think of this as a mental state, but really it tends to be much more bodily. And some people are more aware of this than others. And we can all develop the capacity to feel into our body and notice that yes, when we're very anxious or very fearful or very angry, there's a lot of activation, a lot of felt change within the body, which feeds the sense of anxiety, agitation, anger, etc. And there is a kind of vicious cycle that gets set up between the object body, the conceptual examination of experience and the direct mammalian sensation of activation within the body cavity. And these two feed off one another and amplify the feeling of discomfort. It's actually true that all emotions work this way, even the pleasant ones. Within Buddhism, even pleasant emotions are felt to be associated with suffering because of what we go through when the pleasure ceases. There's a sense of loss and a desire to cling to the pleasure for as long as possible. In Buddhist thinking, that's understood as a cause of suffering. Well, we can work to settle ourselves a bit by bringing some wise comprehension to bear. And this was a topic discussed last time, and I want to go a little further with it. So we can use the objectifier function of our human minds with their ability to name and categorize and compare, etc., to understand a little more clearly and in a little more detached way what's going on here. We can remind ourselves that there is a whole region of the brain that I think all of us have probably heard of by now called the limbic system, which underpins our emotional experience. This is a different region of the brain by and large from the objectifier, and it's reasonable to move it over into the mammal body as part of its experience. Of course, the two are continually playing off one another as mentioned. So the limbic system is often referred to as the mammalian brain because it has so much to do with social emotion. This distinguishes it from the reptilian brain, which is lower down and more concerned with basic functions, and it distinguishes it from the human brain, which includes the objectifier and other higher processes of reasoning. So this is our mammal body, the emotional feelings mediated in part by the limbic system, and then all of the sensations of bodily life, the pains, the pleasures, and so on. Now, we can move our attention into the mammal body in a way that limits our conceptualization, and as it were, takes the objectifier partially offline. And this is actually the goal in many meditation practices, to have a direct experience of our body, not one where we're detached and looking at it from a kind of distance using the objectifier. This takes practice, and that's why people meditate over years to develop the ability to feel their bodies directly without intervening with a lot of objectification. Feeling into the body can be a challenge, though, because it's, after all, sometimes very uncomfortable when there's a lot of emotion going on. So rather than 
maintaining that centration of experience within the body, we tend to escape, as it were, up into our thoughts and our concepts and keep the emotions more or less at a distance, sort of pushing them away, locking them away as best we can. This takes a lot of effort and it's never fully successful, but most of us are engaged in some version of this a lot of the time, and I certainly am. Well, to get beyond that, it helps to bring some of that comprehension in and look a little bit more at what's going on in emotional arousal. So the limbic system has some structures in it you've no doubt heard about, the amygdala, which is related to and mediates, uh, among other things, fear and anger reactions, the hippocampus, which lays down certain types of memory, the insula, which is giving us information about the interior body, uh, and then there are many other regions. All of it is associated closely with the organ systems in the body core. So when we're in an experience that can feel unpleasant, like some sort of conflict or dispute, the body naturally gets activated to deal with the challenge. Much of this activation comes from the so-called sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system is one that operates below conscious control. That's why it's called autonomic, referring to autonomous. And the sympathetic branch is the one that activates the body. It speeds the heart, increases the force of cardiac contraction. It withdraws blood from the digestive tract, thus slowing digestion, and shunts that blood to large muscles, which are needed to meet whatever challenge. At the same time, there is a flood of hormones and neurochemicals, which we can collectively refer to as body chemicals, that activate the system. So you've heard of some of these probably, uh, epinephrine, often referred to as adrenaline, cortisol, both of which are considered so-called stress hormones. And by activating the body, they place it under stress, which is helpful when we're trying to deal with some threat. Of course, one way to deal with a threat is to battle, and another is to flee, and that's why this is often referred to as the fight or flight system. But really, it goes beyond that. If we're in a, uh, in a lot of sexual arousal, we will also get some sympathetic input and some activating body chemicals flooding through the system. And you'll notice that the sympathetic nervous system does provide nerve input to the reproductive organs. And they play a role in certain stages of the sexual response. Well, the sympathetic system has a counterpart a kind of opposite called the parasympathetic. And this one is active when we are inactive. So it comes online when we're resting, digesting our meals, and so on. You've perhaps heard of the vagus nerve. This is an important parasympathetic nerve. It travels through the body cavity and innervates all the organs there. It provides the opposite kind of input from the sympathetic system. It slows the heart and gentles its contraction and res restores blood flow to the intestines so digestion can resume. Parasympathetic input also flows to the reproductive organs. Some comes in by way of the vagus nerve and some by other routes. The parasympathetic input works in concert with the sympathetic input. Thus, the sexual response is a mix of the two influences, each dominating at different phases of sexual arousal and orgasm. Obviously, our sexual experience includes both the feelings of activation at some points and feelings of deep contentment and ease at others, which is another reflection of the bimodal influence of sympathetic and parasympathetic input in the sexual response. Activity in the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system is accompanied by a corresponding release of body chemicals that have similar effects of calming the body, promoting digestion, facilitating healing, regeneration, immune functions, and so on. They're also associated with feelings of safety, warmth, and comfort. Most of us have heard of some of these, such as serotonin, oxytocin, endorphins, which are the body's opioids, and there are many more. Well, it's not just lying down and resting, which stimulates the parasympathetic system. Any leisure time when we're with someone that we feel safe with can cause the same softening of the body's uh, inner state, leading to feelings of ease and comfort and support. Many styles of meditation, including what I try to offer, also tilt the balance toward the parasympathetic system, which can be quite helpful. 
I think we're all aware that in our culture, many of us spend far too much time activated and stressed. So learning to cultivate the ability to bring parasympathetic responses on board is very useful and healthy. If you're interested in all of this information about the emotional reactions and the chemical systems, etc., I recommend this book, Good Chemistry by Julie Holland. She's a psychiatrist. Now, of course, it's nice to spend large amounts of time in a parasympathetic mode, but life does demand that we get actively engaged at time, and so it requires some sympathetic activation. So in the ordinary course of life, we alternate between sympathetic and parasympathetic modes. Moving into the sympathetic mode out of parasympathetic when some challenge or conflict arises, and then back to parasympathetic when we've you know, got things back settled. And then the next time something comes up and needs a lot of uh, energy, we shift over into sympathetic and then back to parasympathetic when the pressure is off. So when we look upon all of this with the objectifier, you know, initially there is a sense where we're kind of looking at things from a distance. But as we move our attention more and more interiorly, we can start to kind of embody the emotional state and feel into it more directly, using the objectifier a little bit less and the direct feeling of the mammalian body a little bit more. Sometimes feeling into the body can be challenging. After all, it's very uncomfortable to feel strong emotions. At first, as we get used to that process, we can alternate our attention so that we keep it for a little while in the area of emotional discomfort, perhaps in the chest or belly, and then shift it away to a more neutral region. And we can titrate. This is a word used uh, by Peter Levine's system known as somatic experiencing. We can titrate how much of the difficult experience we focus on so that we don't overwhelm ourselves. We build up the capacity to sit with some discomfort and then we give ourselves a break as needed. So that idea of moving into the body with our attention and moving out again is a very valuable one. There are more neutral regions where we can direct our attention, such as the palms of the hands. In addition, the skin itself can serve as such a neutral region, the entire fabric that enwraps the body. Now it happens that the skin does respond to emotional state in terms of how moist it is, or even how oily, in terms of how much blood flow it's receiving, and we can, using the right instruments, measure electrical conductance changes at the skin that vary with emotional state. But by and large, the skin is one of those more neutral areas that we can use in mindfulness to balance out the experience of more difficult sensations deeper inside. And of course, we can add to sensations of you know, the moisture in the skin and the blood flow, which uh, can be very subtle, the feelings of warmth, which is easier to detect, and you know, the feeling of a little bit of caress or, or light touch or comfort. So if we have something difficult going on inside, we can balance it by feeling held by the skin, like a living embrace, a blanket of life wrapping around us, offering a kind of nurturing. When we do that, we're hearkening back to our early experience as infants held while nursing. Even if we maybe did not have parents who were able to provide the safest and most nurturing environment, all of us were held at times with enough support that we survived. And so we have this body memory of being held and wrapped while relaxing into the warmth of a mammalian experience. And we can bring that memory to bear on our experience in the present day and imagine the skin as a living, loving membrane that wraps around us. And we can alternate our attention from whatever emotional discomfort we feel within to the warm embrace of the skin on the exterior of the body's form. And then after a period of rejuvenation with attention on the skin, we can return to the interior and alternate in that way. Gradually over time, we can let go of the sense that we're observing this by some sort of detached mental capacity and settle into the direct experience of being a mammal with a supportive environment around us. And even if we happen to be in a situation that feels a little unsafe, we can always tune in to the support of the body itself, and particularly the enwrapping of the skin. 
So we've reached the end of this third session about sensitivity. We've been exploring the mammalian experience as warm-blooded, hairy or furry creatures who develop in a womb and suckle at the breast as young. We've seen how mammalian skin plays a key role in all of these mammalian characteristics. How skin-to-skin -skin contact is so important to our sense of well-being beginning in infancy as we nurse. We're building up our sense of the skin as a living fabric that is sensitive and warm, that gives us a rich experience of the tactile world. And we're feeling that skin as a wrapping of living fabric, an embrace of life itself, all around our body and our mind. In the next two sessions, we'll go further into more subtle sensations of aliveness that perhaps arise from the cellular level, and a sense of profound and palpable immersion in a vast living world, when boundaries soften and we feel less isolated and less at risk. Thank you for your interest in mindful biology.